All right. Welcome, everybody. This is. Thank you all for joining us uh, at this Thursday, May 25th, regular scheduled city council meeting. Um, may we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks. Here. Councilmember Clark. Here. Councilmember Peterson. Here. Vice Mayor Brown. Here. And Mayor Kaiser. Here. Would you all join in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Are there any additions or deletions this evening? <laughs> okay. And we do not have any presentations this evening, so that will take us to item four, which is additional materials. Staff has received numerous additional materials for tonight's agenda related to item 8A. To date, until the time that the meeting starting, staff received 131 comments. Um, of those, only two were in opposition to item 8A. In addition, although they were not processed as additional materials in accordance with our policy, staff has also received numerous phone calls and voicemails this week um, in support of item 8A. Great, thank you. All right, this will bring us to item 5, which is oral communications. I just want to remind everybody in the public that this is for items that are not on the main agenda items, and or they could also be on consent items, just nothing on our regular agenda. Do we have any communication from the public? Uh, good evening, uh, Jerry Jensen. I um, just wanted to... Um, let everybody know about the uh, Capital Wharf Enhancement Project. We have a community meeting that's set up, uh, that's scheduled for June 7th at 6 to 7.30 at the New Brighton Middle School Performance Art Building. Um, and we also um, have um, our survey that is out, that is being advertised right now, and will be out on social media tomorrow, and that's at uh, www.capitalvillage.com uh, slash wharf. And so the survey's out and um, also in there uh, on the same website, it has uh, information about the community meeting that is scheduled on June 7th. So hopefully everybody can participate in the survey and also come out and attend the meeting at New Brighton. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other members of the public? I don't see any in-house. Is there anybody online? We do have one speaker with their hands raised, Mayor. Um, Paz Padilla, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City uh, members. I am Paz Padilla, Community Action Board Director of Programs and Impact. And with me is my colleague, Elisa Sanchez, Programs Coordinator of the Homeless Prevention and Intervention Service Department. And as you know, this month is CAB's um, um, Celebrating an Action Month uh, in during May. We are designated community action agency of our county. Uh, we're responsible with the mission of elimin eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services. And we are also part of the national network of over 1,000 community action agencies across the country who are celebrating Community Action Month this May. As part of acknowledging Community Action Month, CAP highlights partnerships and impacts. Uh, one of our wonderful collaborations with Capitola is having Vice Mayor Kristen Brown in our Board of Directors, and we're so appreciative of her time and support. Thank you, Kristen, so much. It's always good working with you. And as you know now, CAB in the city of Capitola has had a long-standing partnership to help low-income families, seniors, and disabled residents to avoid eviction and homelessness through our rental assistance program known as RAP. We are so grateful to be a current community grant partner with the city of Capitola to provide this visual assistance to the city of, resident, uh, of residents of Capitola. This fiscal year, July 1st, 2022 through the present, we have been able to serve eight Capitola households, benefiting 19 people, including nine adults and 10 children. To show you an example of the positive impact your funding partnership has on vulnerable Capitola households, we'd like to share a client's story with you. 
Brock recently helped a single parent with two children that was close to facing, facing eviction. The client's children became ill and the client was unable to secure childcare to continue working. The client was worried about facing eviction as she has no support system within the community. The client was very relieved and grateful for the assistance our program was able to provide. Thank you for your continued support and collaboration with CAP to help vulnerable Capitola residents stay safely housed. For more information about CAP's rental assistance program for Capitola residents, please contact us at 831-457-1741. And to follow CAP's Community Action Month activities, please visit CAP's website at cabinc.org or follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other speakers with their hands raised on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, that'll take us to staff comments. I think we have one staff comment this evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to announce for the public that our housing element is out and it's published on our website at cityofcapitola.org. The next um, Planning Commission meeting on June 1st, we'll have a uh, public can make comment on the draft document and then again at our city council meeting on June 8th. So hoping the public, you can see it at Capitola, uh, cityofcapitola.org and submit public comment to the community development department. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I don't know if uh, anybody has noticed, but our beach and lagoon is back. Um, it's great seeing our public works out there working well into the evenings every night uh, the last couple of days. It's also a National Public Works Week, so I'd like to acknowledge them and all the great work they've been doing, especially now that we've uh, got a little bit more normalcy back in our beach, so good news. Yeah, and Council Member Clark, that is a huge part of our city, so thank you very much, Public Works. All right, that will take us to item seven, which are our consent items. These can be um, moved in one action um, or unless anybody wants to pull an item. I'll um, move to approve item seven, consent items A through F. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Consent passes unanimously. We will be moving on to item eight, which is our general government. Um, I unfortunately have to recuse myself from item 8A. I also live in a mobile home park and I live within 500 feet of the park that is in um, subject to this ordinance. So I will pass it over to Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, we'll give it a second uh, for the mayor uh, to step out. All right, we're gonna proceed with item 8A, which is the mobile home rent stabilization. Recommended action is to consider adoption of an urgency ordinance adding chapter 2.18 to the Capitola Municipal Code establishing mobile home park rent stabilization and consider introducing for first reading only, waiving full reading of the text, an ordinance adding chapter 2.18 to the Capitola Municipal Code establishing mobile home park rent stabilization. And we will start with a staff report. Good evening, uh, council members and members of the community. Uh, I'm the city attorney, Samantha, hello, good evening. And uh, We have really, really um, pressed to bring this ordinance to you tonight. And it has been a group effort. Um, it really has been an effort between uh, the city manager, the community development director. I don't know if Deepa from my office is on the line. And even in the past few hours, I've been in contact with a couple attorneys for parks in town. So it really has been a group effort to get you this tonight is indicated by the fact that your city manager was editing the PowerPoint literally a minute and a half ago. So I'm gonna thank you in advance for your patience as we get through this. This is some complicated subject matter and uh, please ask me questions as you have them and we'll do our best. Okay, 
We are bringing you two ordinances tonight. We're bringing you, well, next slide, should have said. Uh, Okay, so I'll start with the introduction. Uh, on May 11th, the council received an update on the Cabrillo Mobile Home Park. At that meeting, the council gave direction to me to return at tonight's meeting with an urgency ordinance, stabilizing the rents for mobile home parks in Capitola. Next. We brought you two ordinances tonight. One is an urgency ordinance, one is a regular ordinance. Substantively, these ordinances are the same. They do the same things. I will give you an overview uh, later in the presentation. The overview applies to both ordinance, ordinances. The guts of the ordinances are the same. What is, different, it, what is different is the procedure. An urgency ordinance has to pass by four votes of the council. A regular ordinance has to pass by three votes of the council, and an urgency ordinance is effective tonight. It's effective immediately upon passage. A regular ordinance is effective using the regular ordinance adoption procedure. So we are bringing to you tonight the first reading of the regular ordinance. If you adopt for first reading tonight, we would then bring back a passage, or some people call it a second reading, at the next meeting. It would then be effective 30 days from then. So I think that date is July 8th. So the urgency ordinance will expire when the regular ordinance becomes effective. And so we often bring these, these two ordinances together. The regular ordinance, this procedure gives you just a little bit of an additional layer of protection, while the urgency ordinance lets you act quickly. The, okay, oh, one more thing uh, that came out of the last meeting, the direction from the council, which was, as I mentioned, the urgency ordinance will expire upon the effective date of the regular ordinance. The regular ordinance will also expire if any state law is enacted that is more protective than the protections in the, than the rent cap and any of the provisions in this ordinance. That's pursuant to council direction from last time. Next, please. Related legislation, there's a few uh, kind of related laws that I wanted to go over. One is the mobile home residency law, which is sort of an umbrella law governing mobile home parks in California. It does not stabilize rents. It actually, uh, the law sort of makes rooms for makes room for local governments, cities and counties to stabilize rents, which is what we're doing. So we are sort of slotting into the kind of space left for us by the mobile home residency law. Uh, the Tenant Protection Act we discussed last time, that is the uh, essentially rent control for the state of California. It does not apply to mobile homes, but it caps annual rent increases at 5% of rent plus CPI or 10%, whichever is less. Uh, that is the formula that we use pursuant to council direction for the ordinance that we're bringing you tonight. Next. Okay, there are rent stabilization ordinances for mobile homes in multiple cities and counties around the state. I do not know the total number. Do you, city manager? About 100. Um, and these are just some of them. This is a somewhat, um, I selected these just to give you an idea of what other jurisdictions are doing. Some of these jurisdictions I thought might be somewhat similar to Capitola. Um, some are huge, just in their, you know, Los Angeles I think is on there. That's just to give you an idea of what Los Angeles is doing. And then I included all of the jurisdictions in Santa Cruz County that have a rent control, a mobile home stabilization ordinance. So what you'll see in this, or in this chart is that the ordinance before you, which is consistent with council direction, is the most conservative of all of the ordinances. It has the highest rent cap, and we'll get into vacancy control in just a minute, but it has one of the higher vacancy control caps, which you can see uh, Lompoc also has 15%, as does uh, Malibu. Okay, next. Alrighty, an overview of the ordinance. As I mentioned, it sets the allowable rent at 5% of the rent plus CPI, or up to 10% of base rent, whichever is lower. Okay, thank you. Uh, it permits, the ordinance permits the, per permits the owners to raise the rent of vacant spaces by 15%. And so 
This is what I mean by vacancy control. Uh, the regular ordinance applies to um, any unit that is uh, occupied. The vacancy control applies if the unit is vacated. If the unit is vacated, the a park owner can raise the rent by a bit more than is permitted when the unit is occupied. And then much of the ordinance actually is dedicated to a dispute resolution procedure if the landlord would like to raise the rent in an amount that is higher than what is in the ordinance. And that procedure is laid out in some detail in the ordinance. And part of the purpose of that is, is to really encourage the park owner and the residents to work out any disputes amongst themselves. And if they're unable to do that, to lay out a procedure so that the parties can then, it, ultimately sends the parties to arbitration. So there is an outside third party who would adjudicate disputes. Next. Then there are some requirements for the um, park owner in the ordinance. One is regardless of whether the park is subject, some parks, multiple parks actually in Capitola will be exempt from this, from the rent stabilization provisions in the ordinance. Regardless, every park owner is required to provide certain information to the city um, within a certain number of days. The city will provide to park owners a city information sheet, which will provide information to residents about the ordinance. And then within 60 days, a park owner must register and provide certain identifying information to the city. The ordinance also allows the council at a later time to adopt an, a rent stabilization administrative fee, which would cover any cost of administration of the ordinance. And that fee could be assessed on the owner. I think it's, it can be assessed on the owner and up to 50% can be passed through to the residents. That this ordinance does not include a fee. All this ordinance does is include the authorization for the council to later adopt a fee. If the council wanted to adopt a fee, we would bring that back to you with a resolution. Next. All righty. <laughs> this is the, um, <laughs> this is the uh, part that we've been working on today in consultation with some of the park owners. So this is not as clean as we might like to bring to you, but we um, wanted to at least get you what we could. There are a few changes that we are proposing to the ordinances. One is in the definition section, which is section 2.18.020. It's to the term comparable space. And we'd like to suggest the changes that are redlined on the screen. A mobile home space in the same mobile home park that is suitable for comparison, taking into account such characteristics as the location and size of the space, lot size, landscaping, adjacency to freeways, ocean views, or amenities. And the purpose of these changes is to provide a little bit more detail to that provision so that it's easier to administer. The next change is in the exemption section, which is section 2.18031. And this is the section that talks about the types of mobile home spaces that are exempt from the ordinance. I'll go over a full list of those in just a second. But the changes to this provision, true it up with any changes to state law. Hold that question. It, I, I can see you have a question. I'm going to get. I'm going to talk about the exemptions a little bit further. So hopefully, I'll answer it then. Um, the next change is to 2.18040 stabilization of rents, and this section pertains to how I, I think it's actually a subsection, isn't it? Um, base setting of base rent, base rent calculation. It's stabilization stabilization of rents, and then base rent calculation section two, and this section. Um, applies to when and when a space is subject to a long-term lease, which as I'll talk about in a minute, is exempt from this ordinance, and then the lease expires and the ordinance and the space becomes subject to the ordinance. This section talks about how the base rent on that space is set. And this section says that the base rent will be set by the average of the three highest rents of comparable spaces on tonight, May 25th, 2023. This is, 
this is a bit of a, um, this was a change made in consultation with one of the park, with two of the park, um, park owner attorneys. And we believe this to be a um, sort of middle of the road option. You know, this is, I, I understand the council's intent to be to protect tenants in the community and also to take into account that there are different park owners in the community and try to really balance those interests. And so this is, this provision is a step towards that. Next, please. Alrighty, so these are the exemptions to the ordinance. Most of these exemptions are um, come from state law, and so, but they're repeated in our ordinance so that our community can have everything in one place. So spaces that are subject to a lease longer than 12 months um, would be exempt from this ordinance. So many of your park residents now are subject to leases that are longer than 12 months. They would be exempt from this ordinance. Uh, Newly constructed spaces after 1990, there's been a slight change to state law there, but it, so it's really newly constructed is now defined in state law as spaces constructed in the last 15 years. So it's a rolling basis of what um, would be exempt. That This provision actually mirrors the Tenant Protection Act for um, uh, residents in California that does not apply to mobile homes. Spaces where the tenant does not claim the space as a principal residence, so second home or vacation homes would not be subject to this ordinance. And then spaces that are subject to any agreement that offers more protection than the ordinance. So any agreement that um, includes a rent cap that is more protective of the tenant, that is lower than this ordinance, would not be subject to this ordinance. So this ordinance would not operate to raise any um, rents of of spaces that are already subject to an agreement. And parks that are owned by the residents are also exempt. Next. Okay, so this is just a chart that applies those exemptions to the ordinance. And so you can see that the, as it stands now, the many of your parks are resident owned. So those would not be subject to the ordinance. There are three, that are not resident owns, resident owns. One would be subject to the ordinance. One we don't think would be subject to the ordinance, depending on what their rent increases are that they're subject to now. But we assume that they are lower than the ordinance because that's an affordable park. And the other one, surf and sand, um, we believe that some tenants are in long-term leases. Those residents would not currently be subject to the ordinance. When the long-term leases expire, they would be. Um, other residents, we don't know. We don't know what the status is of their leases. Next. Is that it? And that's it. So the recommendation is to consider adoption of an urgency ordinance and consider adoption for, consider introducing for first reading only a regular ordinance. What are your questions? Thank you. Uh, we'll start with questions from the council. We'll save our comments for after public comment, but if there's any questions, now would be the time. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Finn. Um, if we could go back to the previous slide. We briefly went over surf and sand, and I'm curious whether this ordinance, once it, the surf and sand expires or the term leases end, would this actually allow for rent to be more, you know, there's more room to be yeah. more expensive. I'm just wondering if it, it's giving them more room to increase the rent above and beyond what they, do you, does that make sense? Let me try. I, I think you're asking about the, the residents who are subject to current leases. Right. Yeah, so once those leases, ex they're not subject to the ordinance now because they're, sub they're in long-term leases. Once those leases expire, they would be subject to the ordinance and the base rent would be set pursuant to that formula a few slides ago. So the base rent would be set at the, high, the average rent of the three highest comparable spaces as of today, the rents as of today. Okay, and then my second question is, when you showed us the comparison from city to city, and we're going on the the most conservative, I think you used. Can you tell me a little bit why staff is presenting the most conservative versus what other cities? Yeah, it's us are doing in terms of the 
rent, the rent cap, it's what council requested. In terms of the vacancy control, uh, we are, we just selected something. We didn't get feedback from the council about that. So if the council would like to change the vacancy, the amount of the rent increase permitted under vacancy control, the council is certainly welcome to do that. Can you define vacancy control? Yeah, so vacancy control is when the unit is vacant, what can the, can the landlord raise the rent? So, um, you know, if there is no vacancy control, when the unit is vacant, the landlord could raise the rent to whatever, triple, quadruple, whatever, and then the next tenant comes in and that's their base rent. With vacancy control, we say when the unit is vacated, it's been the rent has been stabilized while they're in the unit. When the unit is vacated, the landlord, there's still control over that unit, but it's a little bit looser than when there's a tenant in it. So the landlord can raise the rent by 15% as opposed to the max uh, when, the, when someone's in the unit. Those are all my questions, except can we, oh, there it is. That's all I needed to see. Thank you. Got Thank it. You. Yeah, I had a question um, about the, for emergency ordinances requiring four-fifths vote, and is that 80% um, or how does that work? I'm considering Margaret recused herself. Is that a all four of you. Oh, it's, oh, is your question, is it four of, is it, a supermajority of the full council or a supermajority of who's on the dais? Yes. Yeah, it's a supermajority of the full council. Okay. So all four of the council members would need to vote in favor for the urgency ordinance to pass. Thanks. Yeah. All right, any further questions from council? All right, so we are going to get ready to open a public comment. I wanna thank you all for taking the time uh, to come out tonight and participate in the public process on this item. A uh, few points I'd like to make before we begin. Um, first, in Capitola, we have a long tradition of respecting everyone's point of view and their right to express it during public meetings. So when members of the audience boo or cheer when someone is speaking, it can sometimes intimidate others from feeling that they are in a safe place to express what they want to express. So we do ask um, that we don't do any kind of booing or cheering during the public comments themselves. I also recognize that not everyone in the room will want to speak tonight, um, but would prefer to express their support for what others might say. So if you um, would like to support something that someone is saying during public comment, feel free to just raise your hand to signal to the council that you are in agreement with what is being said. Um, and hopefully that will help us to maintain an environment that fosters inclusion for everyone to share their um, thoughts on this without having to actually get up and speak if they don't feel comfortable doing so. Um, City Council requested that staff prepare and present this rent stabilization ordinance based on resident testimony from previous City Council meetings. Those comments are still on the record. Um, they, they don't need to be reiterated tonight. We, we have those uh, in, our, in our public record. Um, before we get started, can everyone who wishes to speak at public comment tonight just raise your hand so we can get an idea of how many comments we might have? Okay, all right. Uh, with that, I will uh, stick with our three minutes for public comment. Um, I'm gonna ask the city clerk to help us stick to our time limits. There'll be a, a little beep and the light will turn yellow when you have, what is it, Julia, one minute left? When you have one minute left and once the light turns red, your time is up. We're not gonna you know, get a big cane and like drag you off, but please be mindful of your time um, and, and respect our clerk if she lets you know that, that your time is, is over. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and open public comment now. If you'd like to speak, please feel free to line up here at the dais. Uh, Julia, is the mic on for Madam public? Vice Mayor. My apologies. Madam Mayor. Yes. Can I, um, there is one uh, suggested change to the ordinance that I forgot to read. Oh, sure, so sure thing. If I could have one more minute to read that. Indeed. It is in section 2.18050, vacancy control. Okay. It's the definition of a lawful space vacancy. The ordinance now defines a lawful space vacancy as occurring because of the termination of a tenancy, um, the abandonment of a mobile home, and we would suggest adding a vacancy, a vacancy occurring due to sale of a mobile home on site to any mobile park, mobile home park owner approved purchaser pursuant to California Civil Code 
that just makes this provision more comprehensive. One other note I would, uh, you might want to check in is, is how many comments you have online, because I see we have a fair number of online attendees. Yes. I just, Before we get into the, uh, yeah, the public. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to our attendees on Zoom, we do have a lot of attendees this evening that um, we'll take all in-person public comments, and then we'll take Zoom comments after our in-person commenters have spoken. So as of right now, we have about, it looks like six hands raised on public comment online okay. um, with about 16 attendees. Okay. All right. Am I still on? Yes. Um, okay. We will stick with the three minutes. If you can make your comments in under three minutes, we welcome that as well. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and get started. Yes, my name is Michael Smith. My wife Maureen wanted to be here tonight desperately, but is very ill. We're both in our 80s. So we have lived in Santa Cruz County for many, many years. Fine capital, extremely pleasant to live in, in our last years. And we have been able to get by because we bought our manufactured home it is on a lot in capital in the est estates up there and in t finding talking to other people in that complex we find various uh, people's needs as far as money and extremely we we find many, many times that the people there right now with what they are paying barely make it on their minimum, you know, amounts that they have. And 56%, they would have to move out. Where would they move to? Not only in Santa Cruz County, but in almost anywhere in California. And so I... I want to thank all of the people here for the hard efforts they have put into being here tonight and very much encourage you to pass this ordinance because we will see people moving out if, if, if it's not. And I, I really hate to do, see that. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Sorry, thank you. There's also the medical bills. Uh, I've had to cut back wherever I can, uh, but our rate increase of 55% would negate any budget cutting that I've made. Thank you all for your consideration. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is David Perez, and I'm also a resident of Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. I've been a resident there for 17 years. Uh, my wife and I are raising two teenage boys that are on the autistic spectrum. And teenage boys, uh, if you don't know, um, a bottomless pits of stomachs. And so uh, we've been trying to do our budget, and I've been planning my retirement for over a year, which is coming up next week. So the letter from Vieira uh, really felt like the rug being pulled from underneath us. So uh, retirement means lower income. And we've been adjusting our budget. And this increase, as you can imagine, uh, will take a huge bite out of that budget. Um, it's hard enough right now, and an extra 300 plus dollars a month uh, going out is, is, I'm not sure how we're gonna do that. 
uh, I guess, part-time job, huh? Uh, I was present at the last meeting, and I was really so amazed and happy to see how receptive you all were to this flight we're in. So I, I thank you all. The city attorney <laughs> uh, made a comment. She was so surprised to have an applause. Uh, but I want you to know that I, not only did I give applause, I gave you a standing ovation, and it was richly deserved. So uh, uh, to finish up here, I just urge you to vote uh, for this urgency uh, ordinance in our favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. And um, I'm from um, the Frio, the Frio Mobile Home Park, and um, I was going to say about um, the rent's like so expensive. My family can't afford it, and all. So, Eh, pues como familia estamos preocupados por el aumento de la renta y pues estamos pensando en, en el impacto que tiene a los niños porque el moverse es cambiar de escuela, familiares, es un impacto muy grande que ellos este verano no lo están disfrutando como debe de ser por el impacto y, y es mucho el 55% que nos están pidiendo de renta. I'm going to go ahead and stop our time. We do have a translator who will be able to provide translation for our comments, so please hold. We want to thank our police department staff for helping us out this evening with this. Good evening. Officer Ponciano with Capitola Police, and I'll be uh, translating today, okay? She's saying that the amount 55% increase, it's a lot that they are asking. It's going to affect her and the family in various ways. With the increase in rent, um, she's saying that's going to affect her in various ways, such as lifestyle which would cause her to move out of the city, go to a different place where she feels it's not going to be comfortable for her. You know, uh, they would have to leave family behind and friends and loved ones. All she's asking is for it to be a stop of the increase on that they're asking because it's going to not just affect her, it's going to affect everybody in the community, especially people coming from low income that are barely, you know, meeting ends meet. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lindsay, you did a great job. Uh, good afternoon, and um, again, thank you so very much for all of you to support us in this moment. Um, just um, a quick comment is that uh, two years ago, more a little bit more than two years ago, when I moved, uh, right now I really, I really feel like I betrayed from Vieira's enterprises because, you know, I bought the house for my mother with uh, the illusion that we're going to be the owners one day. Uh, we never expect this surprise that, you know, uh, this increment is too much for all of us. And also, as I say before, you know, I need to hold three jobs in order to make a payments for the house. And even my family is helping me. Uh, we are a far away to be the owners of the real mobile home. And on top of that, the, the payments for the, for the rent is absolutely... Um, out of this world. And so, again, 
really um, appreciate you can do something for us in the we want to to work with him and i love the park it's really quiet very nice neighborhood we love each other and we help each other so uh thank you for so much for your support thank you thank you welcome Hi, good evening my name is john haken and i'm a resident of cabrillo mobile home estates Thank you, Ms. Suttler. You put in such amazing hard work. We really appreciate the residents, myself, value your help, and the city and the council for the commitment to our community. 56%, I think somebody said, I'd love that kind of pay rise. We all struggle, we'll all struggle with that. It would be such hardship. I have health issues. Raising my rent would significantly impact the quality of my health care and necessitate adjustments to my prescriptions. Any increase in housing expenses directly affects my ability to allocate resources towards my medical needs, which are significant. I urge you to vote for the rent stabilization ordinances so that we can continue to live here and that I can afford my health care. And we take a lot of stress off a lot of people. As you can see, we have a great number of people, of residents and their friends and family in the community here tonight, along with their relatives, showing support for uh, the urgent uh, uh, piece of paper of law. And uh, please give us a wave. To show your support. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, good evening. <laughs> At least it's not mine. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> My name is Diane DeLisle, and I live at Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. I'm 83 years old. I live alone. I rely on my friends and neighbors in the park for daily social interaction and to help me, especially my next door neighbor who's awesome. <laughs> the possibility of losing all this has, oh, um, the possibility of losing all this because we can't pay rent is horrible. I love the social interaction. I love seeing and talking to the children. I love the laughter, just greeting people as they walk by and I'm gardening. Um, the idea that even if I could hang in for a while, many of my neighbors would be gone, especially the children, and that makes me extremely sad. We were in escrow for my home in 1989 during the Loma Prieta earthquake. There was always rent control from Capitola, thank you, and then uh, the 12-year lease, which you helped us obtain. Uh, so we had rent stability, uh, but now, uh, obviously, we don't. But I do thank you and your staff and everyone behind the scenes for, um, for all your help in these days as we have faced a 55% rent increase on June 1st. We need the urgency ordinance, both now and in the future. And this is my main point. Otherwise, the Vieiras could raise our rent as much as they choose and as often as they like with only a 90-day notice. And I have no doubt that they would take advantage of that in the mobile home residency law. 
So I'm urging and thanking you for, please vote and keep our rents affordable. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Well, I know I'm repeating myself, but I do want to express my deep appreciation for what you guys are doing on hopefully that we can count on all of your votes since we need all four of them now. So I'm a little nervous about that. Um, but I, I have been approached by two residents who did not want to speak, but um, coincidentally were both single parents raising teenagers, which is what, uh, you know, well, my son is not a teenager anymore, but I also was a single parent. And um, uh, and it, and one of them told me that she was working two jobs um, and both of them were very low income. So I, I wanted to say that of two people who uh, were not comfortable coming up to the microphone. Um, I also... Uh, appreciate the administrative fee that is on the ordinance so that way um, you guys know that we have your back if you do have to defend this ordinance and I hope that perhaps that might encourage you to uh, vote a yes on this ordinance as well. I thought that was wise. Um, not that I know a lot about ordinances. <laughs> um, and uh, I just also want to express my uh, deep love for my community, my very vibrant community, and um, I, just hoping that all the, the wonderful children that play in our park are going to be able to continue to um, go to Capitola schools, and that uh, all of the elders who I love very much and have concern for a number of them will be not uh, stressed and able to retire safely and um, live out their years uh, with housing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. My name is Mariam. I also live in the park with a family of three. This is our Idra, and she's 12. And I wanted to let you know that tenant organizing committee and tenant sanctuary helped us so much um, by helping us draft our letters to you and coming to so many of our meetings. I was just really impressed that people in the community who don't live in the park supported us so much. And um, I learned I, last council meeting was the first time I've ever come to a council meeting and I found it very interesting and I was looking forward to this out of curiosity's sake. I didn't even know any of this went on. I mean, theoretically I did, but it's very educational to see in person. So I just appreciate everyone's time and thank you for hopefully supporting Dream Over Home. So thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, um, I'm not a resident of Cabrillo Mobile Homes. I was here, uh, made a comment last time as well. Um, but I am a resident of Santa Cruz County and have been since I was six years old. I have family and many friends who live in mobile home parks. And just, you know, speaking from my own experience, not behalf on anybody of, of anybody in the parks, hope that you take this wide support of 130 comments and many, many phone calls as a mandate and justification to protect the residents of Capitola. And I hope you do that with pride because all of these residents, as you know, are wonderful and deserve to live here. And I find it a point of pride that I get to call them my neighbors. Um, and, I, you know, I hope that you do everything to... Um, make this possible. And also just note that Capitola and Santa Cruz County have been called the least affordable places to live in the country. So why, why wouldn't you protect them when there are so many other places in California who already normalize these protections? It's, you know, it's already, um, you know, a pretty common policy throughout the state and other states. So um, I hope you kind of, it's been stated already, but I hope you know that we're all behind you, um, you know, Everywhere else in Santa Cruz is, and I know that 
uh, these residents and many of us are, will continue to fight, will continue to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Rita Medina, and I am also a resident of the Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. We live in number five. I was raised by my single mother who is out here in support. Um, we, I grew up in a lot of bad neighborhoods and things like that. And when we finally came to Capitola, it was like getting our first home. <laughs> Being in this place and having the rent be so low when we first moved in was amazing because it helped us get me through college and university. And now finishing my education and having my own profession, um, I gave her a chance to take a back seat. But with the rent increase, uh, I'm concerned because she has had health issues over the years. So my mom has diabetes and she's been going through eye surgery and things like that. And it's a yearly thing. And I've been able to help her out with that. I'm concerned that with the rent increase, she won't be able to have the time to just take the time to take care of herself. And I don't want her to have to take more hours of work. And I know that this is something that definitely would benefit not just us, but everyone else in the mobile home park. We have a wide variety of different languages that are spoken in our park. Lots of Spanish speakers that I know um, weren't probably comfortable to come up and speak. We have other people who have different ethnicities, ages, and people who are scared to speak up knowing that our faces will be pinpointed. But we, we thank you for your time, your support, and your help, and we hope that you feel yes. Thank you. Do we have any additional in-person speakers for public comment this evening? Okay, seeing, oh, any more? Sure, come on up. Uh, buenas tardes, voy a hacerlo en español. Uh, no sé si la persona we, que traduce. Un momento, can we get our uh, translator? Ah, sí, buenas tardes. Sí. Eh, mi nombre es Mireya y vivo en, en, en el parqueadero de Cabrillo Mobile Homes. Y estamos aquí, estoy aquí eh, tratando de pues hacerles saber la preocupación que tenemos las familias desde que se nos hizo el aviso que se nos iba a subir la renta. Hello, my name is Mireya, and the reason I'm here is because of the concerns regarding the uh, increase in rent and how it's going to affect our family. Han sido tres meses de muchas preguntas, eh, mucho vocabulario que no se entiende y que aún estamos tratando de descubrir en los traductores, en los diccionarios, entender las leyes de la renta, de cómo se... Cómo se eh, hay mucha, mucha confusión. There's been a lot of questions and concerns regarding the uh, red increments that I have yet to understand, and it hasn't been clarified to me as to how everything goes about and how the process works. Estamos preocupados, sí, muy preocupados. Estamos aquí para pedir el apoyo de, de ustedes, eh, que nos protejan. Hay muchas cosas que no entendemos, pero queremos su, su apoyo para que haya un control de renta. All I'm asking is for uh, some clarification and your guys' support. And the reason I'm here is because I want to be able to have somebody to clarify and help us understand what's going on and give us better details. Uh, soy madre de tres hijas, tengo mi esposo, y pensando en el futuro, eh, sería muy difícil uh, pagar una renta con un 55% que aún no entiendo cómo podría ser posible que se pasara. I come from a family where I have three kids, my husband, and the increase of 55% in a household of five, it's going to be affecting our family in various ways. And I wanted to... Uh, Make it understand how that's going to really affect us in so many ways. 
uh, muchas noches sin dormir, muchas noches uh, pensando sobre nuestro futuro y a veces está aquí en sus manos para continuar en, viviendo en Capitola con mi familia. I have had sleepless nights and uh, I've been stressing out and all I'm asking is I'm leaving this in your guys' hands for you guys to support us and for you guys to help us out in any way possible. Gracias por su atención. Thank you for your attention. Gracias. Any further in-person comments? All right, thank you. We'll go now to our online public comments. The first speaker will be Adam. Adam, you've been allowed to unmute yourself. Once you start speaking, you'll have three minutes. Hi, and good evening. Um, I just had a couple of questions, uh, maybe comments. Uh, I took some notes on the slides um, as quick as they could. It looks like this, the rent stabilization um, ordinance is gonna affect about 100 spaces. Um, the 63 spaces within Cabrillo, and from what we can see, about 32 spaces and surf and sand. Is anybody able to confirm that? Uh, sir, we welcome uh, your continued comments. Public comment is not a time for back and forth. After all the public comments are uh, over, the council members uh, have the opportunity to ask staff to respond, but at this time, it's just an opportunity for us to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what it looks like to me is, is that the, the stabilization ordinance <clears throat> fee is going to be assessed on all um, spaces within the city of Capitola. Um, so from our understanding is that the uh, all spaces will be assessed as fee and it will really be for the protection of about um, 100 spaces within, within the city of Capitola. Uh, it's a little bit unclear as to what was defined as comparable spaces in the average <clears throat> um, of the three highest rents within a particular park or a region within that park. Um, there seems to be some, un some, some uh, unclear aspects of the ordinance on how this would be applied to spaces that are coming off of uh, long-term leases. For instance, the 34-year leases. <clears throat> At the expiration of those leases, our understanding is that as of May 25th, um, uh, we would take the, the average rents in a comparable space in that park. But if that space turns over 22 years from now, it looks like we're taking a snapshot at 22 years in the past. So I think that needs to be clarified. What I would suggest happen is something like uh, a temporary freeze of any rent increase or hike for up to 30 days and invite all the stakeholders within uh, the city of Capitola to come to the table and and discuss this in, in more detail so that uh, the council can make a um, a more educated um, uh, decision on on how this would affect everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, is there any way to make this louder? The online public comment just louder in chambers. Thank you. The next speaker will be Bodhi Shargal. Bodhi, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. All right, wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Bodhi Shargell. I'm a UCSC student and a resident of Santa Cruz. I'm a member of the Tenant Organizing Committee as well as the Student Housing Coalition, who I believe you all received a letter from as well as Santa Cruz Yimby. And I'm uh, an alternate to the County's Democratic Central Committee who um, I believe you've received a letter from our chair. Um, I'm giving comment to support or to, to voice my support for rent stabilization in mobile home parks in Capitola um, because I couldn't afford a 57% increase in my housing costs. And I think that most of you all in the room could not either. Uh, I also just moved into a new place and let's say that uh, Considering Santa Cruz's housing market, it took me more than 90 days to, to find a new place to live. Um, Santa Cruz County in the state of California more broadly is uh, facing uh, an extreme homelessness unhoused e epidemic. And it's things like this that lead people to becoming unhoused, sharp increases in the cost of housing. You know, there's not much separating those of us here who have stable housing um, from those who don't beyond a couple 
bad weeks that don't go in our favor. So people in um, mobile home parks are often living on fixed incomes or living paycheck to paycheck. And an increase in rent of 56% is gonna lead a lot of people to becoming displaced or unhoused. And that's not something that I think should be happening in, in our communities. So I, I urge you all to, to support this urgency ordinance. Um, and I appreciate your time and appreciate the consideration that you've given to this. It's, it's been really encouraging to, to see this put on the table. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mark Alpert. Mark, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Mark Alpert, and I represented uh, the city of Santa Cruz, excuse me, the city uh, Serpent Sand Mobile Home Park um, 15 years ago or so uh, through many years of very difficult and very costly litigation over the rent control ordinance. Rents in the city were really incredibly low, irrationally low, and we fought for years, each side spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and we got to the edge of a trial in which the city was exposed to millions of dollars in damages and the city settled its litigation. And as part of that settlement, these long-term leases were offered. Now, this, what the city is, seems to me is rushing in to do right now is to undo the benefit of those settlements. The park owner did the park owner's part. The park owners have offered the leases that were the subject of uh, the settlement. And now when these leases have expired, as part of that deal, the park owners were supposed to be able to raise their rents to fair market rents. Now with the park owners having done their part, the city is, is reneging on its part of the deal. It is undo attempting to undo the benef fundamental benefit of the settlement agreement. Look, I understand the emotional appeal and, uh, of, of why uh, you might want to adopt and rush into adopting mobile home rent control, but I don't think you've had enough time to think about the potential litigation costs that are very, very likely to result from making the decision to adopt rent control. Now, even if you were to adopt rent control, you're not going to get the benefit that you think you are. There are fundamental constitutional provisions of rent control that say the base year under a rent control ordinance has to be established at fair market rents. Now, you may not like the, the space rents that have been increased to or are planning to be increased to in Vieira's Park. By the way, I don't represent Mr. Vieira, but there's one thing I can say with pretty good confidence, they're still gonna be below fair market rent. So what you're gonna do is drive Mr. Vieira into a costly administrative hearing process with the city and then potentially costly litigation You'll potentially be in costly litigation with surf and sand, very likely, if you adopt this ordinance. And, and you're doing it to benefit a very, very narrow, small group of people. You're going to put the city at financial risk. Look, I understand finding a way to help these residents, but find a way to help these residents without embroiling yourself in more costly litigation. Find a way to help these residents without reneging on a fundamental economics of the deal that the city made with the park owners. Uh, in fact, you could-, you could I'm so sorry, sorry, but that's been three minutes. We're gonna be moving on to John as the next speaker. John, you've been allowed to speak and you will have three minutes. Hey, y'all. Uh, so I would just like to say, obviously, I'm a resident of Capitola. I support this ordinance. Everyone I've spoken to in our community supports ordinances like this, but especially in this situation. Uh, this is one of the last places welcoming to families in all of Capitola, uh, the mobile home parks as a rule, especially to single mothers. Uh, I just, uh, I really hope you guys vote for this and are certainly not dissuaded by bad actors. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jean Brocklehurst, or Brocklebank, excuse me. Um, you have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hi. My name is Jean. I'm 78 years old. 
I have lived in a rent controlled um, mobile home park in Live Oak for 33 years. And I um, commend this city council for the action that I hope it will take tonight. I wholeheartedly support uh, the ordinance, the urgency ordinance, and hope that the city will not be dissuaded by threats of lawsuits. I think you've done your work well, and I think it's worth going ahead and trying this. I do have one suggested uh, change in the or, or an amendment for that I hope you will consider. Um, and before I say that, I I would like to say that this ordinance is good for the park owner, as well as being good for the residents. The rent control ordinance that we live in, uh, in the unincorporated county, has benefits for both owners and residents. And I can see that you have provided a lot of benefits for park owners in your ordinance. It's not just about the residents, even though that's where my heart lies. Um, the, what I'd like to suggest to you, having lived in a mobile home park for 33 years, uh, we don't have vacancy D control. In other words, if a home passes from a child uh, to, um, from a parent to a child, or if a home is sold and uh, somebody new moves in, the space rent doesn't go up. It doesn't cost the park owner anything for a home to change um, residents. It costs them nothing. So you have 15% in there right now. And I would like to recommend that you do like the county does and just have zero. If you feel that you must do something else for the park owner, at the very least, drop that 15% down to 5%. I hope that you will consider that um, because the, the way the ordinance is written now, this park owner is going to make between 50 and what, 50 and $60 a month more from every resident this year. And then the next time he'll be able to do it again and again and again. And I, I think you've given a lot to the park owner in your ordinance. And um, I hope that you, I hope the city council will vote in the four fifths and pass this urgency ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Bruce Stanton. Bruce, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Uh, Bruce Stanton, corporate attorney for the Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, which is a 60-year-old California nonprofit corporation that represents California mobile home residents. And I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the GSMOL members residing in Capitola. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. Since 1986, I've specialized in representing mobile home residents, including in connection with negotiation, drafting and implementation of mobile home rent stabilization ordinances throughout California. Rent regulation for mobile homes is purely a local issue. Without it, park owners are free to set rents in any amount. And over 100 California cities and counties have enacted some form of mobile home rent regulation. Courts and commentators recognize mobile homes are really not mobile at all, but are immobile homes in immobile home parks. And only 3% of mobile homes ever move before final salvage. These ordinances note the large investment that mobile homeowners have in their homes, often their most significant asset. And with attached accessory structures and landscaping improvements, these homes comprise a significant sunk cost investment and are not depreciating assets. So once attached to the land, um, they have the same equity characteristics as real property. A mobile home located in a landscape park space with common area improvements and streets and utility hookups has a site value equity component, which courts and market have consistently recognized. And really th there's a captive nature to the mobile home market that's particularly significant because when rents go up, Mobile homeowners can't simply move to a better rental situation. They have no alternative but to pay the rent or else sell the home for a bargain price or maybe abandon it. Many residents have a mortgage that limits their options. And as one federal court famously has pronounced, quote, the park owner has the mobile home resident over a barrel, unquote. 
Residents living in this one part Cabrillo are facing a rent increase of over $350 to take effect one week from today. And it's thus critical that this council, if they're gonna take some action, needs to preserve the status quo of this key affordable housing and act tonight. GSML urges adoption of the urgency ordinance to protect them. I've reviewed and worked with many ordinances throughout California in the last 35 years. And I can say based on my review, of these proposed provisions contained in the ordinances before you tonight, I have to conclude they are eminently reasonable and constitutional. The annual percentages are higher than the majority of ordinances, which allows 75 to 100% of CPI, and they match what state law has put into place in the um, Tenant Protection Act of 2022. Thank you for your comments. That was three minutes. The next speaker will be Linda Vieira. Linda, you've been allowed to speak You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Vieira, owner of Vieira Enterprises in Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates. And for the record, I wanted to let everyone know that we oppose the um, adoption of the ordinance 1059 that proposes to add chapter 2.18 to the city's municipal code. And we apologize for this late opposition to the council but we did not receive any notification of this council meeting or this agenda item from the city or anyone else. So since there's several severe elements of this restrictive legislation that we oppose, but unfortunately due to not having received adequate notice, we cannot fully articulate our details of our opposition. Therefore, we urge the council to forbear adoption of this unworkable ordinance at this time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Saulo Londano. You've been allowed to speak, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Saulo Londano and I'm with Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association. Since 1945, we have worked with owners and operators of mobile home parks in California on training, education, and public, pol public advocacy and public policy. Here to speak in favor of more conversation and cooperation between the city, residents, and the park owners. We always favor agreements created out of meetings of those involved rather than top-down rent control regulations, which creates an adversarial relationship between all of those involved. As Mark just mentioned, let's not forget the difficult situation that happened here in Capitolia the last time it attempted rent control. Is this really the best path forward? In our experience, it's always a better solution for everyone to sit down in the room together and work things out. We do this type of work throughout the state and know from experience that there are many ways to help residents in need, including rental assistance programs, models that have been running in California for over 30 years. There are always better ways to handle these situations than forcing park owners to take their case to court. If this council does move in the direction of an ordinance, here to, to, to state that it is imperative to give managers the option to raise rents to market when there is a vacancy in these parks. The vast majority of ordinances in California do not have a cap on vacancies. The staff's current recommendation to cap those at 15% will create a hardship that could only lead more and more to court and administrative court costs for all involved, park owners, the city, and the residents who much of these costs are passed on to. It's important to understand that raising rents on vacancies is the only opportunity that park managers have to catch up to the market due to the effects of rent control. Without this option, parks will have progressively less and less resources to maintain basic infrastructure and amenities that residents in this community deserve. Thank you for your time. The next speaker will be Denise. Denise, you have three minutes. Denise, spelled with a Z at the end of your name. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I want to say thank you for recommending the urgency ordinance. We are so grateful and sincerely hope it passes this evening. I'm also really proud of the park owners, I mean, the park neighbors and residents for all the work that we've done and refuse to be bullied into agreeing to something that really is so unreasonable and unfair. My name is Sandy Denise. My husband and I are co-owners of a mobile home in Cabrillo. 
mobile home estates with our daughter, Andrea, who lives in the mobile and works two jobs in the local community. She pays a mortgage on the mobile in addition to space rent, utilities, and expenses of home ownership. The park has residents that are seniors and people on fixed incomes who with the extreme rent increase will be a financial hardship. That's so true. The park also has residents who are younger or middle-aged working class people who will also be financially burdened without the passage of this ordinance. The jobs they have may not have pay high wages, may not be the jobs that most people would choose to do, but these are jobs that are essential to the businesses in Capitola and the surrounding communities. It's important that they can continue to have affordable housing options in order to keep those jobs and not have to leave the area. It would be so unfortunate if these hardworking residents were priced out of their homes because of unreasonable rent increases. I urge you to please vote yes on this urgency ordinance tonight. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Jonathan. Jonathan, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Jonathan, you, it's, uh, if you are able to hear us and you would like to speak, you have three minutes. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker. Good evening. I'm calling in support of the ordinance heard here tonight. I've worked in various public sector positions over the past decade from staff positions in county parks to state senate. I've witnessed and participated in housing and tenant protection discussions up and down the state. When the community came in strong support of Capitola after the massive storm impacts this winter, we saw how many people care for Capitola and its people. Tonight, you as a council have an opportunity to support your constituency and show that support to everyone who has cared about or visited Capitola over the years. We have heard from various residents in various parks how they've managed to stay in the region and survive the relentless housing conditions our inflated market has produced. This is despite the number of rental, vacation, and secondary homes that comprises the coastal community. Regardless of what the opposition may say, it's important to honor the balanced approach staff has taken in writing a non-targeted ordinance. More work can be done to protect tenants, but any step towards protection is a blessing that many mobile home tenants have otherwise not been offered. Unlike the Vieras' request of forbearance of this item, no forbearance has been offered to residents from the Cabrillo estates who have benefited from long-term leases and general rent stability. Court is not the only option to park owners, but they will continue to argue a false dichotomy because they continue to practice an unwillingness to work with tenants and be an actual part of this tight-knit community. I respect and honor staff's work on this item. I thank you for your time. Please support the ordinance tonight. The next speaker is Vicki Winters. Vicki, you've been allowed to speak. You'll have three minutes. Hi, I just wanted to um, speak out. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County, also a renter. Um, and I wanted to address some of the things that have been said by people opposing the ordinance. And that is that um, the time for everybody to sit down and bring all stakeholders would have been before they decided to um, raise the rent 56%, which is price gouging. There's no other word for it, price gouging. And I really thank the Capitola City Council for your taking action in this matter and considering this ordinance. Um, and it, it's really something that needs to happen now before the rent increase goes into effect. So um, I really appreciate your timely action on this. And I just want to point out, it's my understanding that the Vieira Enterprises owns two other mobile home parks that are under the rent control ordinance of the county. So, you know, they're claiming that somehow a rent control ordinance would keep them from profiting or, or doing business. It doesn't really hold water knowing that they operate two other mobile home parks that are, are under rent control. So I do urge you to adopt this ordinance now. Um, and that's what needs to happen. Uh, thank you very much. The next speaker is Char Garza. 
Good evening. Um, my name is Charlene Garza, and I um, work for Evans Management Services that manages mobile home communities, not only in Santa Cruz County, but across the state. I've been active in working with cities and counties on developing uh, and um, implementing rent control ordinances from the owner's side. I would like to encourage that you guys take a moment to look at other options that have been implemented in cities and counties across the state, such as a memorandum of understanding. That often will uh, benefit both parties and will save uh, city and county expensive and costly fees of administering a rent control ordinance. Thank you. Vice Mayor, at this time we have no hands raised on Zoom. Great. All right, thank you so much to everyone uh, here in chambers as well as those online for your comments. Uh, I am so sorry, we do have one other speaker. <laughs> oh, well, okay, we will take, uh, we, will, we will put uh, end of the line after this speaker, so we'll have one final speaker. Nicholas Robles, you've been allowed your, to speak, you'll have three minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm Nicholas Robles. Uh, I'm a student at UCSC, and I'm also part of the Student Housing Coalition. And I just wanted to say that there's a lot of great speakers out, out here today. Um, and I just wanted to repeat that point that 56% in a rent increase is a crazy amount of money for anybody to afford in, in so little amount of time. And we have to think about where that money would go when there's a rent increase like that because right now the money that's being spent by residents are revolving in the local economy but if we take it into consideration of the rent increase money going into the pockets of the sorry the landlords then will we really be seeing that money go back into the local economy or will it be going elsewhere? Um, and so things to think about when this happens, other than just um, talking about the price for everyone. Um, and so that was my comment. Thank you for letting me talk. All right, uh, with that, we are going to close public comment now and bring it back to uh, City Council. We'll have comments and deliberation now, and then for a point of process, after our comments and deliber deliberation, when it's time to consider a vote, we will have two votes to give tonight. We will have a vote on the urgency ordinance and then a vote on the regular ordinance, so there'll be two separate votes. Um, and until we get to that, uh, we'll open it for comments. Or should we want to start at the end? Yes, thank you. I had just a couple of questions that our ordinances are not in Spanish available. That we have our, you know, our ordinances in Spanish. No, we don't. We don't translate our code. To, uh, okay. normally. That's just hoping something we can get done. And hopefully, we can also incorporate some Spanish outreach in the future for uh, something like this that uh, affects so many of our citizens. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I had to type this up because you saw it was a bit of a mess earlier, so I have to pull it together. Um, so when I asked for this item to come back, I wasn't too sure what our options were going to be. Um, as many of you know, unfortunately, I was unable to attend the last meeting. Um, I was at my daughter's little recital, so truth be told. But what many of you witnessed was a council at the meeting who I believe understood that we must do something or we wouldn't be here today. I'm grateful for Vice Mayor Brown for taking this to the next level and requesting that this ordinance be brought forward to us. Now, we heard today that there may be some challenges that lie ahead. And as we move through the next few weeks and months of this temporary ordinance and then finally the final ordinance, council may have to deal with additional pushback or even litigation. However, I am proud to be on the side of support, not just for its emotional appeal, um, but because this affects real people's lives, seniors' lives, children's lives, and the workers in our community. And it's our responsibility, my responsibility as a representative to ensure everyone has the opportunity to thrive here. 
So additionally, I would like to ask staff to ensure that residents be kept up to date on next steps and they, uh, that they understand that rent, a rent increase is inevitable. And my hope is that our staff can ensure everyone is, in, is clear on that and what this ordinance actually means, both in English and Spanish. Um, so with that, I'd like to make a motion and I'm hoping we can get something um, up on the screen. Bear with me momentarily. I will have the recommendation up shortly. Just to kick it off with a motion, let's get this going. Right, and is that be updated with the additional link? Okay, great. So I'd like to make an emotion, a motion to um, number one, adopt an urgency ordinance adding chapter 2.18 of the Capitola Municipal Code, establishing mobile home park rent stabilization with the changes read um, into the record during the city attorney's staff presentation, and two, introduce for first reading, only waiving full reading of the text an ordinance adding chapter 2.18 of the Capitola Municipal Code establishing mobile home park rent stabilization with the changes read into the record during the city attorney's staff presentation. And to confirm we can do that in one vote, we don't need two separate votes? I'd suggest two separate votes. It's fine to have both motions on the floor, but you could take them one at a time. You want a motion, are you giving motions for both? I'll, okay. I'll make a, yes. Okay. So we, I can start with one. I'll make a motion to adopt number one and see if there's a second. I'll second for the sake of uh, discussion. So we have a motion and second on the floor. We'll continue discussion. Um, and then we'll come back for a vote on, on that first motion. Is that the end of your comments? Yes. Okay, awesome. Comment? I was curious um, for the record when Linda Villa said that she hadn't been contacted. Can you, can you talk about that? I'm assuming that's you, correct? So, Sounds like the question is, is about notification for the ordinance. Yes, so we noticed this consistent with the Muni Code and consistent with state law for ordinances, which includes posting, but I don't know whether or not, I don't believe they were directly contacted. So the agenda was published in accordance with the Brown Act 70, over 72 hours prior to the meeting. Um, as a part of our notification process, we have an agenda distribution list. All of our City council members, staff members, and many of members of the public are signed up for email notification. Every time the agenda is updated, I send out an email notification to this list, which includes details on how to participate and comment on the meeting. Um, so members of the public, we can't sign people up without their consent for this distribution list, um, but members of the public can sign up for the distribution list through the city website. In addition, the ordinance once adopted, if adopted this evening, a summary of the ordinance will be published in a paper of local circulation in accordance with government code, as well as an introduction of the ordinance would be published in the newspaper as a summary. Um, and once adopted, the ordinance would be published again. So that's three separate newspaper postings in the legal advertisement section, which goes out to all of Santa Cruz County um, as a paper of general circulation, and that's what's required as a part of the government code. So ha has there been any efforts by staff or the residents to negotiate with Fear Enterprises prior to tonight? So staff has done a number of things. Uh, we have had multiple meetings with the park residents and the park residents attorney. Uh, we have reached out to a partner who the city has previously worked with to help acquire a mobile home park on the other side of town uh, to see about a potential acquisition of the park. Um, so we've taken a number of steps to try to find proactive solutions. Unfortunately, none of them ultimately succeeded. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, we have a motion to second on the floor. I just want to make some brief comments um, as well. And for anyone who wants to fact check me, all the information I'm about to provide is available on Data Share Santa Cruz County, the county's website. Um, 
First, I, I do want to address, there was a, a comment about there being a fee that's part of the ordinance tonight. And I want to clarify for those uh, that public comment that there is no fee in the ordinance tonight, but the ordinance does give the council an opportunity to enact an administrative fee in the future. Um, thank you. Um, some of the public comments spoke about, uh, you know, this is just an emotional appeal and that the council's not informed or had enough time to consider the costs, um, which quite frankly is a little bit insulting considering the time that I know that each and every one of the council members puts into ensuring that we know what we're doing up here. We understand that the consequences um, and impact of nearly every single decision that we make. Um, there were, of course, some suggestions of you know fear tactics of what we should be afraid of. And I'll say that making decisions out of fear is an incredibly terrible idea. Um, and even if there is any fear in making these decisions, it is nothing in comparison to the fear of losing your home. Um, so with that in mind, I want to you know, state some facts, which is 56.6% of capital households are under the area median income. 10% of our families are in poverty, 10% of our seniors are in poverty, and 14% are below the poverty level. Spending more than 30% of income on housing can create an undue financial hardship, especially for low-income people. It may not leave enough money for expenses such as food, transportation, and medical expenditures. And in our county, almost 60% of render, renters spend 30% or more of their household income on rent. I'm a renter. I've uh, been a renter the entirety of the time that I've been on council. I've had to move twice, and twice I didn't know if I was going to be able to find a place where I could afford to live. And if I were to now be faced with a 56% rent increase, I would not be able to afford it. Housing is a human right, and each person deserves a peace of mind in knowing that your housing is secure, that you have housing stability and the ability to plan for your financial future without the risk of unreasonable rent increases. And 55%, 56% rent increase is an unreasonable expectation of stability in considering housing costs. Um, mobile home parks is traditionally one of the forms of affordable housing in our city, and I think it's on us to protect and preserve that. And at the very bottom line, I think this is just the right thing to do. I appreciate all of you for coming out and giving your comments tonight. They are touching. Um, and I hope and encourage my council members to move forward with this in support of our residents. All right, so we have a motion and a second uh, on the first recommendation. Uh, can we get a roll call vote? And this is on the urgency ordinance, particularly. Um, and then once the vote is um, passed, if we could get a JP to come and announce in Spanish what just happened, what the vote was, um, so that everyone in the audience is aware of what's, what's happening. Uh, okay. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> All right. Um, Our translator is. Oh, is he not in the room? On the way. He's on patrol. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to. He's multitasking this evening. <laughs> He's doing his job. So let's go to the second part, and then if we can get. Uh, Oh, here he is. Maybe he can translate both motions. Yeah, let's get the second once. part going, and then we'll have the whole translation, and, and I'll, I'll summarize so that we can Perfect. We can translate. Um, okay, so you had, did you? Yeah, so I have a motion on the table for item two. When did you second? You need to read the whole thing? Let's go sure. for it. Read the you whole know, thing. Make we might as well again. make you all stay here a little bit longer, right? <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to introduce for first reading only waiving full reading of the text and ordinance adding chapter 2.18 of the Capitola Municipal Code establish, establishing mobile home park rent stabilization with the changes read into the record during the city attorney's staff presentation. And I'll second. Okay, uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. Passes unanimously. Um, can we?
so our our city clerk is what? It's a little bit much. Yeah, our city our city clerk is sharing what just happened to be translated, but maybe for the sake of translation, we could just say that um, the, ordinance the ordinance has passed and effective immediately. Um, there, the rent stabilization goes into effect immediately. There will not be a fifty six percent rent increase. Just announce it, or go yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. In Spanish. <laughs> um, so, uh, decidieron en español, decidieron en votar y el voto dijeron que el, la renta no va a subir ahorita. Van a distribuir un papel donde va a explicar la información sobre qué va a pasar, lo que van a hacer los dueños, pero ahorita no se tienen que preocupar nada de que el 55% va a subir. Ahorita no. Todo está bien. Pasaron. La City Council pasó eso. Dijeron que se van a quedar con lo que la ciudad ustedes decidieron y los detalles van a, van a poner un papel y se lo van a dar a todos ustedes. And if I could add, if I could add, please. The city will be publishing a fact sheet which will explain the ordinance, but in the meantime, residents should speak with Mr. Stanton, residents of Cabrillo should speak with Mr. Stanton if they would like specific details about the ordinance, how the ordinance affects their particular rent. Yeah. I explained to them that a sheet was going to be distributed. And Did you ask the la at the last part, please? Yeah, the, uh, what was his name? Mr. Stanton, the attorney for the Cabrillo Mobile Home Park residents. Preguntas para el uh, señor Mr. Satan. Oh, uh, I apologize. Satan. Satan. I apologize. Satan. Satan. Um, él pueden ir directo a él y pueden hablar con él sobre lo, lo, que, lo, que, lo que va a pasar. Si tienen más preguntas para que él les explique a ustedes en más detalles. ¿Ok? Sí. I apologize. Sorry, guys. Thank you. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Thank you. He didn't know he was going to be pulled into the role tonight. Thank you. Rise into the occasion. Uh, yeah, let's let's take a, a two minute, five minute. Let's take a five minute break. Um, let everyone get some air. Bring the mayor back, and we will uh, resume. At, let's just make it a seven minute break. We'll resume at seven forty five. What do you want? What seven forty two? Like who's going to keep track of that? Seven forty five. <laughs> it's now a six minute break. It's a six minute break now. Good job, guys. 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 I know. I have no idea what he said. I mean, I would have just said, tell everyone.
action is to approve the tree stump art project and contract with an artist uh, named Anthony Hines May in the amount of $5,500. And Nikki's here to present. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so, as, as stated, I'm here to discuss a current um, public art project that the Art and Cultural Commission has been working on. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, the public art ordinance requires that all eligible construction projects valued at more than $250,000 to contribute to the city's public art by either incorporating public art into the project or contributing to the fund. Currently, that public art fund balance um, <laughs> is at uh, $171,667. Um, about a year ago, um, the Art and Cultural Commission identified a potential public art project using a 100-year-old cypress tree stump that fell in the lower parking lot here behind City Hall. Um, the tree fell in 200, or 2019 as a result of the heavy rains, and it was a significant landmark for the city. And so they reviewed um, proposals for um, a public art project for this tree stump. And after reviewing a concept proposal, recommends that Anthony Hines May as the artist for installation and for the contract. If you'll please advance the slide, Julia. All right, and so we are joined um, by Anthony on Zoom, who is going to provide um, a bit of a proposal as to what the a little bit about his work and the concept. So he uh, he resides in Oregon, I believe is currently in Chicago. So I will hand it over to Anthony to discuss the art. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me talk about my work as submitted in proposal. Uh, for this project. I'm very excited about it because this is the kind of material I work with. In fact, this is uh, the type of occasion I typically create my uh, work within this parameter of trees that are uprooted or um, destroyed by storms. Uh, this first piece here that you're all looking at is um, a piece in Florida that was taken from a tree uh, and created and, and um, redistributed in such a way to make it appear as though a storm or a, a wind gust had an effect on the natural material. I chose this as the initial slide because there's a lot of kinship or likeness to what it is that I'm proposing to create with the stump project in Capitola. If you want to go to the next slide, Nikki, that'd be great. So just as uh, a few smaller examples to show. I uh, did a few other pieces in various natural settings, uh, allowing the material to go back into the natural cycles. So both of these are in rather opposite places across extreme environments. Uh, one is actually up in Quebec and the other one is Wyoming. And these are pieces that are in areas that are highly trafficked um, it doesn't look that, that way, but one is in a, uh, a very nice ranch that uh, people go to visit and uh, <clears throat> experience the rugged lifestyle of Wyoming, and the other is in a national park through Canada Parks, and I've worked with different agencies like Parks and Recreation in the creation of my work, and it's very much in public space and in, um, in I guess in this case, also in, in private uh, lands that are that are distributed out for the public to come experience uh, different types of environments and ecologies and ecosystems. So all this material is derived on site, it comes from site that I've appropriated and used in order to create these sculptures. If you could go to the next slide, Nikki, that'd be great. So my process consists of me using uh, some 
<clears throat> saws like chainsaws and band saws in order to get my materials prepped, which uh, is a process of taking it from site off site into my studio or a space that I'm able to rent out. In fact, I was speaking with some places in Santa Cruz that allowed me to uh, work in their environment to be able to fabricate some of the processing of my pieces uh, for the Capitola um, tree stump project. And um, so these are just a few images that show that I've worked with larger pieces that uh, somewhat similar to what you have there with the cypress that slid from the, the top of the embankment. And um, so I just wanna show a, a variety of, of this process. Um, yeah, next please. So I take all the material, I load it into a truck or uh, however I have to transport it. Uh, sometimes that can be kind of uh, exciting and adventurous. I've used furniture dollies on um, the LIRR in New York City in order to transport my uh, stump material in some cases. Uh, I don't think that would have been possible with the Capitola tree project uh, or stump project, I should say, because it's just such a massive piece of material. I think it, it's about a five foot diameter. So the piece that I intend to create is going to be a lot larger than what we're seeing here. But uh, as far as material cuttings go, but fortunately, Nikki was able to pair me up with some of the city workers that clear off the beaches. Uh, and I'm hoping to bring some of that cypress material into the trunk because a lot of the trunk uh, re remains was was taken away so that doesn't exist anymore so what i'll have to do is graft new material onto the trunk to make it feel as though it's it was a part of it at one point versus my other processes which just shows it all in an order from one stump in a continuum next please So this is showing uh, the the rebar reconstruction process where I, I drill out holes and I slam rebar in place, which is a, a super resilient material. Um, my, my work is very accessible uh, to anyone uh, that's in the area in the sense of, I, I make, let, let me say it this way, I make it so that it's anti, vandal proof I, I let, me, let me say that again um i i use highest structural integrity in my work so that it becomes very difficult for someone to vandalize it or to um, deface it or try to destroy it uh, i have never had that experience so far in my public installations so i don't see that as being a problem with uh, the site and the location and in fact, I, I have a lot of response from community that is very accepting and, and also it becomes like a, um, a point of interest for, for fate, uh, what are they called? Selfies, that's what they're called, for selfies and, and uh, photography uh, vantage points and all that. So uh, I'm trying to show some of the stuff closer to the ground so that you can really see that my work is, is interactive on an on a eye level basis. Next, please. So this is more of the processing. I'll take the material. Uh, I'll wrap it all in the same order so that it stays consistent and then put it all back together so it looks like it's extending out naturally from its base rather than uh, it feels though it's an abrupt change of one space into the next as far as material goes. So in the case of the tree stump project, I'd be doing something similar um, to what you're seeing in these image, images as far as process goes, and then simultaneously, um, uh, yeah, just basically continuing my process, my idea, my concepts of this relationship between nature and humans and trying to reconnect the two together in a time frame when we're all sort of losing our connection with nature and actually thinking that it's... Um, uh, separate from us in the sense of our artificial world becoming more important. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is a piece in Washington State 
uh, from a hemlock tree that fell across a trail. And so much uh, very similar to what I'll be doing with the tree stump project is reconnecting the cubes of material, or in this case, grafting new cubes of material onto the trunk base that's there using the rebar system to make it feel as though it's reaching out into space and, and kind of flowing in this pattern that's relative to the landscape around it. If you can go to the next slide. So as sketches, uh, the tree trunk I used as my base, and then I started working with materials that I assume would be available through all the city work gatherings. And I will then cut the cubes and start putting them together. And these are just two examples of how it could work in procession. So it's all empirical process. There's no specific um, outline of what I'm going to do exactly. So I try to show a breadth of what it is that the piece could look like. So in these two instances, which are rather minimal, I wanted to show how the pieces would expand from the trunk that's there on site. And if you can go to the next slide, Nikki, um, I can show how it pushes further into that interactive space away from the trunk. So again, the highest structural integrity, I've worked in so many environments, extreme environments from hot to cold, uh, and my work has lasted because it's from natural material, and that's the most resistant or resilient material to be able to work with. Also, that it goes back into a natural state, so that makes it even more poignant when we talk about our relationships with nature and how we uh, don't understand the importance of impermanence. And that's really what my work is about, is the impermanence of everything and the cycles involved in everything. <clears throat> and we are susceptible to it as well. So my work is very reflective of our own um, of our own understanding of, of entropy and the way that things uh, work in reality. So here is the push. Here's, here's the, the tree trunk as it is on site with blocks coming off into space, looking as though it's reaching out and kind of following contours of the, of the environment around it. And I think there's one more that's a color slide after this one. And again, this is really um, still very abstract in the sense of it might not look exactly like this, but I wanted to offer a concept of the design work to be able to understand where I'm going and what my vision is for the work. And then I think I have a few more examples of this afterwards as well. So the piece on the right was in Denver, Colorado from a cottonwood tree, which is trees that they normally treat like garbage trees and they just cut them out, and remove them. And this piece on the right in the snow in Colorado lasted for a decade, which is a, an extremely long time. They didn't expect that from the cottonwood. On the left, uh, when I used to live in, in New York, I got a piece uh, that I created in the Rockaways, which was a, a discourse on sustainability and equity. So it was through a, a organization there that offered uh, sculptors to come in and create work and my work was selected. So that's two pieces of tree that come together and form this reconnection between nature, but also as it relates to humanity and what we are all faced with when it comes to natural disaster and catastrophe. I think there's maybe a few more slides, Nikki. Maybe just one more, I don't know. Oh, is that it? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that's the, my my plan is to be able to come to Capitola and work with this amazing cypress tree that unfortunately uh, fell victim to the flooding and and storm damage, in order to resurrect it to some extent to create an homage to it, and so that people start reflecting on nature in a different way, not as something that is. Um, that, that is so distant from us, but something that is an extension of us and that we're an extension of nature. All right, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, so just to kind of conclude the presentation, um, the 
for the current, well, the, the recently proposed budget, um, the public art budget has allocated $75,000 for public art projects that are currently in process by the Art and Cultural Commission, um, which does include the $5,500 um, recommended contract. And right now there is no, there, well, there is no impact to the general fund as a result of this. Next slide, please. Um, and so the recommended action as provided also by um, the Art and Cultural Commission is to approve the tree stump public art project and contract with artist Anthony Hines May in the amount of $5,500. And we are available for questions. Thank you so much. Council, do we have any questions? Seeing none, we can go out to public comment. We'll have a little less activity. Anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Okay. We can take it back to council for deliberation or motion, comments. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, we're excited to see your art in the city. Uh, I will make a motion to approve the Tree Stump Public Art Project and contract with artist Anthony Hines May in the amount of $5,500. I'll second that. Great. We have a motion and a second. And um, I have to say I was not, uh, this wasn't the art that I had envisioned when somebody said the stump is going to have art on it. And it's uh, kind of refreshing. It's something different, something new. And I think it'll be a great addition to Capitola. So thank you. Uh, may we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. We can move on to item 8C. Uh, this is the extra help limited duration retirement annuant. Hi, oh. Mayor Kaiser and Council. Thank you. Sorry, I was just shocked by the microphone. Oh. That was what that reaction was. Um, I'm going to keep it short. It's been a longer, um, an emotional meeting, so we'll just go through the basics here. This is really a formality, um, a requirement from CalPERS. Um, so with some basics on retired annuitants in general, uh, they're governed by government code. The section is on the screen. There are very a few um, very specific rules that the city must follow in order to have an appointed retired annuitant. They're here. Um, very importantly, that the um, appointed retired annuitant may work no more than 960 hours in a fiscal year. They have to have a limited duration appointment. That means there's a start and an end date to the appointment. Um, they are being assigned special projects, working on a backlog, for example, and um, they're paid only an hourly rate with no further benefits. So we are following all the rules, don't worry. Uh, the city manager does have authority to make an appointment. The reason we're talking about this, you may be wondering, is because Robin Woodman, our building official, is retiring. Um, her date of retirement is July 1st of this coming year. And to address that, we analyzed several options. And our city manager has appointed Robin as a limited duration extra help retired annuitant with um, a begin date of July 10th and an end date of June 30th, 2026. So a limited duration to address very specific projects, including kind of a backlog um, addressing recent storm damage in the village, for example. So that was a solution. And uh, the reason this is before you this evening is because generally speaking, retired annuitants must wait at least 180 days before returning to work as a retired annuitant. So excuse me, retirees must wait 180 days. However, there are some exceptions which require council approval. So um, in this case, the reason that we're recommending you waive that 180-day wait period is due to um, Robin would be filling a critically needed position for the city. So you can approve this exception by adopting a resolution, as it says here on the screen, um, my recommendation for you. I'll read it because it is kind of official. To adopt a resolution for exception to the 100-day wait period per government code section 7522.56 and 21224 and approve the appointment of Robin Woodman as an extra help limited duration retired annuitant. And I am, of course, available for questions. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any council questions? Seeing none. Okay. Any public comment? Anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Great. We can take it back to council for deliberation. Comments or motions? I have a question, actually. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Um, is um, voting to approve this going to pose any legal risk given the um, 752756? And so I can respond. Uh, this paperwork, including your the signed resolution, if you're to adopt it, will be submitted to CalPERS for their review prior to the beginning of the appointment. Okay, thank you. I'll also notice that we worked very closely with the city attorney's office on this. Thank you. I did indeed. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's important that we have expertise after somebody's retirement, so I think it's a great idea that uh, we can bring her back on and I'd like to make a motion. A second. Great. We have a second and we have a motion and a second. <laughs> May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Chloe. All right. That brings us to item nine, which is adjournment. And just want to say thank you for everybody that has participated this evening. Um, I think I stand with the council in the fact that we will continue to do the best that we can do for our community um, and f keep it in an equitable manner uh, for those that we rely on for many other things other than being neighborly. So with that said, have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. See the gavel? All right. <laughs> I like it.